Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So you see, uh, so we, so we, as we have just now seen, we have these uh, uh, examples of quasi affine varieties are not affine, all right. And then the uh, what I'm going to do is to tell you about more general varieties, which are called projective varieties, and open subsets of such projective varieties, which are called quasi projective varieties. Okay. Uh, then uh, our definition of variety will include affine, quasi affine, projective, and all and quasi projective. Okay, and these projective varieties are a completely different uh, class of specimens. Okay, whose properties are very different from the properties of affine varieties. Okay, <coughs> but uh, to tell you where they come from, I, I just want to tell you that they come from uh, the process of gluing. Okay, so uh, so let me uh, let me give you some motivation. Uh, so you see, let's let's look at the usual topology. Okay, let's look at the usual topology, and look at uh, uh, well, uh, uh, for example, look at the complex plane or, or, or the real plane, all right. And uh, so, you know, let us do the following thing we take uh, we take uh, the, uh, the usual plane, and then suppose I draw the sphere here, okay. So, here is my sphere. Um, So this is a unit sphere in three space, okay, and assu assume that you are in R three, okay. Assume you are in R three, and uh, what you do is uh, well, uh, uh, you have uh, this is the origin, this is the point uh, one comma one comma uh, uh, zero, okay, uh, and uh, <coughs> or rather one comma zero comma zero. Uh, and you know, uh, so what I do is, if I uh, if I take the if I call this point uh, as a north pole, and if I call this point as a south pole, okay, you would have heard of the so-called stereographic projection, so-called stereographic projection in complex analysis, which identifies. So if I call this sphere as S two, so S two minus the north pole can be identified uh, homeomorphically with R2 okay by projecting from the north pole and S2 minus the south pole can be identified homeomorphically with R2 by projecting from the south pole okay. So these are the, the these are the so called Riemann uh, stereographic projections from the Riemann sphere okay to the uh, to the plane. And uh, therefore, uh, the uh, the sphere minus the north pole uh, is compactified. The one point compactification of the sphere minus the north pole is a sphere, and that corresponds to uh, uh, that will correspond to the extended plane. 
by adding a point at infinity under this homeomorphism. So what it tells you is that the real plane can has a one point compactification which is just the sphere and uh, so there are these two there are these two uh, 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 there are these two stereographic projections. Now what you must understand is that if you consider each of these things they are you can uh, you, you, you can call them as uh, uh, two open subsets of the sphere both are open subsets of the sphere okay and uh, they cover the sphere and each open subset looks like R2 because the looks like R2 means it is a homeomorphic to R2 and the homeomorphism is via the stereographic projection. So what has happened is so what we say is this is a this is a standard example of what is called as gluing. So what you do is you take two you take two copies of uh, the plane okay and you glue them together okay. So basically you take a copy of the plane and then you fold it uh, to uh, get the sphere minus the north pole take the other copy of the plane fold it to get the sphere minus the south pole and you know just glue them together and you get the sphere okay. Now this is a standard procedure you have some spaces you glue them together to produce new spaces but the point is when you do this the new space that you um, that you get will have completely new properties. So for example in this case if you take the sphere the new topological property that you get is that it is compact whereas you know neither of the two copies that you originally started with to glue to get the sphere is compact of course you know both uh, the both R2s are uh, both copies of the plane are non-compact because you know in Euclidean space something is compact a subset is compact if and only if it is both closed and bounded with respect to the usual topology. So, so the moral of the story is that uh, you know actually you are able to by by gluing spaces you are going you are getting spaces with new properties okay and so this gluing process is the process that uh, uh, is used to produce new spaces from old spaces alright and uh, basically uh, another good example of gluing is well uh, you know there are several examples uh, for example you know I can take uh, 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 yeah so you know I can just take uh, I can take the complex I can take the plane okay uh, uh, and and uh, thinking of this as a complex plane let me say something uh, if you glue it correctly okay then you can make sense uh, instead of thinking of S2 as just the real sphere you can think of S2 as a surface on which you can do complex analysis you can make it into a Riemann surface okay and you can make sense of holomorphic functions and then Liouville's theorem will tell you that there are no uh, global holomorphic functions it will tell you that every global holomorphic function will be constant. So uh, the the beautiful thing uh, uh, is that on the plane you will have so many holomorphic functions okay you have so many entire functions whereas this glued object there are there are there are no entire functions the only entire functions the namely the functions are holomorphic everywhere are constant and you know uh, so you are you are basically having two affine spaces you have glued them together to to get this space and this space is compact and it has no global non constant functions okay the same thing happens in algebraic junction a projective space is gotten by gluing a uh, bunch of affine spaces okay and on the projective space you will see that there are no global regular functions the only global regular functions on the, the projective space will be constants okay and it is a complete analogy to what is happening here. So it is a gluing process so projective spaces are gotten by gluing affine spaces just like the sphere is gotten by gluing uh, two copies of R2 right. Uh, of course some other examples of gluing are for example you know if you take uh, uh, if you take a horizontal strip or a vertical strip for that matter and then you know if you uh, 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 or, or for that matter you know uh, well if you glue the, the top edge and the bottom edge what will happen is that you will get a cylinder. you will get a cylinder and uh, uh, that is by identifying the top edge and the bottom edge you cut off you cut the strip and then you identify the top edge of the strip with the bottom edge of the strip and fold it out you will get a cylinder you will get an infinite cylinder. Now the original strip is topologically different from the cylinder because the original strip is is simply connected 
any any nice uh, any simple closed curve in the Dorian strip can be completely you know shrunk to a point where the cylinder is not simply connected because the any loop that goes around the cylinder that cannot be continuously shrunk to a point. So you see again you are produced by a gluing process you uh, you have produced a new topological space with topological properties that are very different from the properties of original space alright. Another example is of course you know you could have taken you could have uh, uh, you could have done also something like this you could have taken just a parallelogram okay and then you could have glued uh, the parallel uh, opposing edges and the result is that you will get a torus because if you glue the upper edge with the lower edge you will get a cylinder with two circles on the two ends which need to be further identified if you identify them you will get a torus and the beautiful thing is that this is simply connected uh, but uh, this is not okay. So the gluing process uh, is, a, is a very standard process it is a process that allows you to produce new spaces with new object uh, with, with new properties okay and you must think of projective space also as coming out of a gluing process okay. So uh, so I will explain how uh, projective n dimensional complex space is gotten by gluing n plus 1 copies of uh, n dimensional affine space okay and on what we are going to do is that we are going to define a Zariski topology on the projective space okay. So we are going to define uh, algebraic sets we are going to define irreducible sets we are going to define closed subsets of projective space call them projective varieties and then whatever we did for affine varieties uh, uh, lot of uh, similar results like the Nullstrom sets etc will also work for the projective case okay uh, but of course certain things will go wrong all right uh, and uh, I will explain uh, in the in the coming lectures in this and the coming lectures what is going to go wrong and what is not going to go wrong. So let me start with the definition of projective space uh, so so the so so P n C so this is complex projective n dimensional space here is complex projective n dimensional space and how how is it defined it is the space of lines in affine space. So complex projective n dimensional space is a space of lines in a n plus 1 okay and uh, through the origin and uh, uh, that is true not only for complex numbers for any field and how do I get it as a space uh, the reason I have to consider uh, lines in n plus 1 space is because you see uh, I want an n dimensional object okay and uh, if I take lines in n space okay by taking lines I am cutting down by one dimension so the resulting space will be n minus 1 dimensional so if, if I take space of lines in n space I will get an n, dim n minus 1 dimensional space okay because I am actually modding out by scalars. So if I want an n dimensional projective space I should take lines in n plus 1 space okay so uh, uh, so how does one get it one takes uh, points in an plus 1 and then you go modulo an equivalence relation what is the equivalence relation the equivalence relation is very very simple so you know uh, you if you give me a point lambda 1 etc lambda n okay then the the that point defines the same line as some other point if and only if the two points have coordinates which differ by a non zero constant multiple okay so uh, you know if if I take a point lambda 1 lambda n so I will call them as lambda naught to lambda n right so I am in a n plus 1 so the coordinates are n plus 1 coordinates which I am not I am not labeling the coordinates 1 through n plus 1 I am labeling them from 0 through n which is the standard convention whenever you do studying projective space. So the line passing through this point so this is the line uh, the line passing through uh, the point 
lambda 1 lambda, lambda 0 lambda n this is a line passing through that and this is what I am going to do I am going to take this point lambda 0 lambda n I am simply going to map it to the line passing through lambda 0 lambda n and of course through the origin the, that is a, that is the line that joins the point this point to the origin I am simply mapping this point to that line okay and what I want you to understand is that this is an uh, this is an equivalence relation in the sense that if you take uh, this L lambda 0 lambda n is the same as L mu 0 etc mu n that means both these points lie on the same line and you know both these points lie on the same line if and only if uh, uh, this is a non zero multiple of that by a single scalar non zero scalar okay so uh, so uh, this is if and only if there exists p uh, non zero uh, element of the field such that mu i is equal to t lambda i for every i okay so you know between <laughs> n plus 1 tuples of points you put this equivalence relation this is an equivalence relation that uh, two points uh, one point is a multiple of the other point by a non zero element of the field okay that is an equivalence relation and if you go model of that equivalence relation what you are going to get is precisely the projective space which is a space of lines okay two points here if they are uh, they, they are equivalent namely they will differ by uh, scale the, their coordinates differ by one in the same scalar non zero scalar multiple if and only if the lines uh, that they define through the origin are the same okay so the space of so what has happened is that uh, 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 we have gotten the projective space as a quotient okay it's a set modulo and equivalence relation so it's a quotient and this is very very good because once you have this uh, uh, for example if I have a topology here I can I can transport the topology here by uh, by by uh, by giving this the quotient topology all right. So uh, it is always good that whenever you have a quotient kind of situation then uh, you can transport from the source lot of things to the target right. So well uh, you know I have the Zariski topology on this because this is after all this is just uh, this is after all sitting inside a n plus 1 which has a Zariski topology this is affine n plus 1 space and uh, therefore this has a Zariski topology and I can put the quotient topology on this and that will give me a Zariski topology on p n all right and, uh, and in fact it will happen that this map is a uh, this map will be an in fact even an open map okay and it will be of course continuous for the Zariski topology all right but then uh, there is another way of defining the uh, the Zariski topology on this in a very uh, in, a, in a slightly uh, 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 analogous way uh, uh, to the the definition of Zariski topology on a fine space. So <laughs> you see so the uh, so the point I want to make is that you know uh, of course I can I I for example you know I could have put k equal to forget k being algebraically closed I could have taken k to be real numbers and then I will get real projective space okay and then I can I can study things on this I can simply take the uh, usual topology on top and then you know give this the quotient topology all right I could have done that and similarly I could instead of instead of k I can I can take complex numbers and then I will get complex projective space and on the complex projective space I could have again put the usual topology I have the usual topology here I could have given the quotient topology okay and because the complex numbers is also an algebraic closed field I have another topology here which is a Zariski topology that also I can use to give a quotient topology here. So uh, complex projective space has two topologies one is the topology which comes as a quotient topology for the usual topology and the other topology comes as a quotient topology for the Zariski topology on the uh, on this on this punctured uh, affine space above okay. So uh, now let me go back <coughs> uh, let me go back to how we define the Zariski topology on a n plus 1 see the Zariski topology on affine space was defined by giving closed sets and the closed sets were given as 0 sets of uh, uh, I mean common 0 loci of a bunch of polynomials okay. Now what we are going to do is we are going to imitate the same thing here what we are going to do is we are going to look at 
common zero loci of a bunch of homogeneous polynomials okay and then you see uh, it will make sense you see if you uh, if you take a polynomial function uh, uh, for a polynomial function uh, of course if you take a polynomial in n plus 1 variables uh, if I change if I evaluate that polynomial on a line all right of course the polynomial the values will change okay but if the polynomial is homogeneous the property of it vanishing or not will not change okay so this is the first observation if uh, if f of x0 xn is a homogeneous polynomial okay say uh, of say homogeneous of degree d then uh, either f restricted to line through lambda not lambda n is identically 0 or or otherwise okay you so what i am trying to say is because this is this is because you see f of lambda not lambda n uh, uh, suppose I put t lambda not etcetera t lambda n is t power d f of lambda not etcetera lambda n for uh, uh, t non zero constant. So, you know if the polynomial vanishes at one point of the line then it will vanish at every point of the line okay. So, in other words uh, so I can make sense of uh, uh, whether a polynomial vanishes on a line or not, but what is a line a line is a point here. So, I can make sense of whether a polynomial vanishes at a point here or not okay and then I define the closed sets here to be common 0 loci of the bunch of points where the polynomials vanish where a uh, all those points where a bunch of homogeneous polynomials vanish okay. So, what you do in other words it makes sense to look at the 0 set of f in p n okay. What is the 0 set of f in p n point in p n where f does not vanish is corresponds to a line on which f does not vanish point in p n where f vanishes corresponds to a line uh, on which f vanishes okay. So, so, so let me repeat I can make sense of the 0 set of a polynomial in projective space namely it is all those lines on which f vanishes it is all those lines on which f vanishes and I can I and I do not have to just do it for one polynomial I can do it for any collection of polynomials. So, what you do is uh, more generally we may define we may define a projective algebraic set in P n to be the common 0 locus of a subset of homogeneous polynomials polynomials in k x naught etcetera x n okay and uh, the fact is that uh, we get a topology on projective space that topology will be the, the so called that will be so, the so called Zariski topology 
okay you can check that this gives a to check that uh, we get a, to a topology called the Zariski topology on projective space by taking closed sets to be projective algebraic sets. If you take projective algebraic sets to be closed sets you get a topology on projective space and that is called the Zariski topology and the fact is that uh, uh, the fact is the following the fact is that that topology is the same as the quotient topology uh, that you get from the Zariski topology on top okay. This topology is the same. Also, that uh, this topology is the same as the quotient topology for pi. I will call this map as pi, the projection. using quotient topology for pi from the Zariski topology on a n plus 1 okay. So, uh, so the moral of the story is that uh, uh, you can get a Zariski topology you can get a topology on this a Zariski topology on this that can be done in two ways either you take the quotient topology I mean it is a topology that you put that makes this map uh, continuous okay and uh, that is one uh, that is one uh, definition okay. The other definition is that uh, you define the topology directly on this to be given by closed sets which are given by common 0 loci of a bunch of homogeneous polynomials. The only difference with the projective case and the affine case is that in the affine case you consider all polynomials but in the projective space uh, in the projective case you consider only homogeneous polynomials and you know why you have to consider homogeneous polynomials because uh, uh, because only for a homogeneous polynomial you can say for sure whether it will vanish uh, uniformly on a line passing through the origin if it is a non homogeneous polynomial it could vanish at some points on the line and it could be non vanishing at other points on the line okay. If you take a non homogeneous polynomial and take its 0 set that 0 set will be hypersurface okay which will be n dimensional in, in a n plus 1 space and that hypersurface could hit the line at uh, not, not at all points it need not contain the line. So, it could hit the line at some points and it could not hit the line at some points. So, a non homogeneous polynomial could vanish at some points on the line and not vanish at some other points of the line. But if you have a homogeneous polynomial it either completely vanishes on the line or it vanishes at no point on the line okay. So, if you take a homogeneous polynomial it is very easy to define uh, the 0 set of that in projective space and then if you take a bunch of homogeneous polynomials then the common 0 locus of this bunch of homogeneous polynomials is what is called an algebraic set and that is how a closed set is defined okay and the, this gives you the Zariski topology on the projective space. And now you know a uh, lot of statements that we know for the uh, usual affine space the same statements will carry over for projective space the only thing is uh, for example in the affine case, uh, case you deal with ideals uh, general ideals and general polynomials in the projective space you will deal only with homogeneous polynomials and you will deal with ideals which are generated by homogeneous polynomials and these are special they are called homogeneous ideals okay. So, uh, just as in the affine case you have a bijection between radical ideals and uh, algebraic subsets 
in the projective case also you will have a bijection between uh, radical homogeneous ideals of this of this of this ring polynomial ring in n plus 1 variables and uh, algebraic projective algebraic subsets but you will have to throw out uh, one uh, ideal which is called the irrelevant maximal ideal and that is the ideal generated by all the variables that is the one that you have to, that you have to throw out and you have to throw it out because on top you have thrown out the 0 of the the 0 set of that which is the origin okay you have to throw that out okay. So and just like in the affine case you where you have the affine Nullstrom and such which says that if you take a an ideal which is uh, 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 you know a proper ideal uh, then the 0 set is non empty uh, similarly you will also see here that if you take a homogeneous ideal uh, which is not uh, uh, which is essentially not whose radical is not the irrelevant maximal ideal then its 0 set will be non empty. So, you get a projective version of the Nullstrom and such. So, uh, lots of this uh, this correspondence between ideals and closed subsets that you had for affine space will also hold for projective space and uh, we will review that in the next lecture. But there is one point of caution the the point of caution is the following. Uh, you can uh, go and start defining regular functions on a projective variety okay on an open subset of a projective variety we will call an irreducible closed subset of P n as a projective variety all right and it will turn out that uh, it will be uh, uh, closed subset will be irreducible if and only if its ideal is prime the ideal will be a homogeneous ideal but you will uh, require that uh, it has to be prime. And uh, what will happen is of course that you know in the in the projective case also uh, if you look at uh, so in the projective case also you can define regular functions the only thing is that in the affine case your regular functions were quotients of polynomials okay. Now you have to define them as quotients of homogeneous polynomials okay if you take quotients of two homogeneous polynomials and assume that the both polynomials are homogeneous of the same degree then that will define a proper function on a fine on, on the projective space because you know if I divide two such polynomials then the t power d's and if they have the same degrees the t power d's will get cancelled and therefore a quotient of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree will define a, a nice function on the projective space functions that look locally like this will be called regular functions on the projective space and then uh, the beautiful thing is that if you try to look at uh, any global regular function on projective space it will turn out to be constant just like uh, if you try to look at a global holomorphic function on the Riemann sphere uh, it has to be constant okay. So this projective uh, and it is true for any projective variety if you look at uh, any global regular function it will be a constant we will prove that okay. And this is in sharp contrast to the case of an affine variety when the global regular functions are given by uh, the all the polynomials restricted to that affine variety and there are so many of them whereas if you go to projective varieties there are no non constant regular functions okay. So uh, and of course I also forgot to tell you just like in this case S2 is a union of two R2s I uh, will show uh, in the next class that Pn is a union of n plus 1 copies of a n. So, the projective space locally is it is covered by n plus 1 open sets each open set looks like a n affine n space. So, what you have done is you have taken n plus 1 copies of affine n space and glued them in a nice way to produce the projective space and the beautiful thing is that though each of the pieces that you glued with have in uh, lots of you know regular functions polynomials on this glued object there is no global regular function which is not constant okay. So, uh, so we will see all these uh, aspects in the forthcoming lectures and uh, let me also tell you one more point of difference that that is that you know for an affine variety the coordinate ring of the affine variety is an invariant namely two affine varieties are isomorphic if and only if their coordinate rings are isomorphic and now this is completely going to be false for projective varieties. Okay. So, the same projective variety can be embedded into different projective spaces and uh, if you try to define the uh, 
the ring of uh, functions uh, on that as uh, the this polynomial ring modulo the ideal the homogeneous ideal you will see that that ring is good is capable of changing. So uh, the embedding of a projective variety uh, in some projective space uh, uh, could be very different I mean all right so uh, you do not have the uh, you do not have the uh, beautiful analog of uh, coordinate ring for affine varieties you do not have the, cor the correct analog in that sense for projective varieties okay. Um, and for that matter that is what uh, leads one to study uh, uh, line bundles and sections of line bundles etcetera on projective varieties uh, which are probably the content of a second course in algebraic geometry okay. But I will stop here and we will continue the next lecture.